I think working with the earth and not against it is so important. And I think it's fitting that we're all here tonight to celebrate you and to celebrate what OGRC and the Oppenheimer family are doing through FIFA. Thank you, Nikki. I can go up in the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's, we're extraordinarily honored to have Jane Goodall with us this evening. And I'm extremely honored to have been asked to introduce her. But really, she needs no introduction. Her persona and what she does and what she stands for have traveled ahead of you. For 60 years ago, over 60 years ago, she first started working with chimpanzees. And very quickly, that work morphed into an understanding that Homo sapiens had to cohabit with nature. We had to work together. There could be no question of us thinking we were superior and could impose our will on nature. And I think that has become ever clearer and ever more important. And Jane Goodall has been an important lighthouse in getting that out into the world and persuading people that's the right thing to do. She is a person who clearly has a great empathy with nature. And uh, a number of years ago, we were privileged to have Jane come to our house to, make, to, to talk to us at uh, uh, a, in a time we had a series of lectures in November. At that time, we owned two Basenji dogs. They're a strange dog, barkless, come from uh, the northern Congo. And while they're unbelievably good within their pack, they're extremely difficult outside their pack, as many people could testify who were speared by them one time or another. But as Jane was talking to us there, the one in Pefu climbed up onto the dais and curled up at your feet. And I thought that was so appropriate and so clear, the connection you had. Thank you for giving us time and welcome, and we very much look forward to the discussions and then hearing from you. Welcome here. Okay, thank you, Nikki. I'd like to now call on Jenny Chris Williams. Um, I think she needs no introduction. Jenny from 702 fame is a, a leader in the broadcasting world and has she kind of cut out the South African media industry and led that. Jenny, lovely to have you and Jenny will take over from here. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that, just knives and forks and spoons and everything. And, um, and I am really looking forward to this discussion. And I've been thinking about it for ages and ages. And um, I interviewed you, you probably won't remember, um, during COVID when um, the company that I was doing a podcast for on books, um, we were talking about a, a series of books um, called endangered, it was endangered gorillas, endangered cheetahs, endangered whatever, and they're picture books, absolutely magnificent. And uh, you were sitting in your sitting room, um, because, I mean, that's where we all were at home, because we couldn't get out anywhere. And, uh, and it was a lovely discussion. 
And, um, and that was the last time I spoke to you. Sorry, I'm just getting myself organized because I like, I like being <laughs> surrounded by things. Um, so Jane, let just the discussion that we're going to have. Um, I'm Jenny Cruis Williams, obviously, and I am thrilled to be here. And um, we are going to be chatting for just under an hour, and then we've got about 30 minutes set aside uh, for questions. And we would ask you to make a not a statement, but to ask a question, and uh, so that we can actually get on and um, and make the most of Jane's presence here. So. We are, and, and let me introduce uh, everybody that we've got here on the panel. And we'll, let's start with Professor Sally Archibald. And Sally, will you just tell everybody basically what you do? And I know you're going to make it succinct. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sally Archibald. I'm delighted to be on the stage here with Jane Goodall, someone who really has worked to make the world a better place. Um, apparently, it's your, not your first time here at WITS. My colleagues tell me you came and visited our department, which is called the Department of Apes, a while back, and you donated them this um, chimpanzee. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember it, but everyone else remembers it fondly, and this chimpanzee sits in the head of school's office, um, and we are delighted to have you back again to be talking together about how to design African futures that work for the people and the precious biodiversity that we have here. Um, I'm a professor in the School of Apes, um, and I work with Odie and Laura and a fantastic team of people on the Future Ecosystems for Africa program, which was a program that was conceived by Jonathan Oppenheimer and his team a few years ago, with the goal of kind of guiding investment and development in Africa into nature supporting paths, pathways that can still benefit and provide for the people of Africa, but that also make sure that we are living sustainably with our environment. Um, and we do that with a fantastic range of people across the continent. Um, and I'd be really excited to get your ideas on some of the stuff that we're doing um, and hear from you about how you've managed to negotiate some of the complexities. So Sally, also, uh, your work with FIFA, why don't you just explain what that is all about? Right, um, so the Future Ecosystems for Africa program, uh, we, it's a collaboration and a partnership between Oppenheimer Generations uh, and Witts University, and then a range of partners across the continent. Um, we work in three different levels. The first thing we do is we actually engage with communities to co-create African futures and imagine new African futures. Um, so really trying to rethink some of the assumptions that have been provided to us that will that drive the solutions that have been provided to us and expand the range of options that are available to us. Um, and there's some great work on that just been published from Malawi, Mbom, Mbombera Rising, is that right, Kumbomoni? Uh, it's an anthology of like African futures and the, the future that we want to get to. Um, and that's a really important place to start, I think. But then we also recognize the value of what my social scientists call powerful knowledge, which I think what they mean by that are data and models and natural science. Um, and this knowledge is really powerful and important, and we want to work with our scientists across Africa to make sure that the knowledge and understanding we have about our ecosystems is scaled up to policy relevant scales to feed into decision makers around like where and how interventions are going to happen in Africa. Um, so that's a lot of work that we do. And then finally we, we do that. We don't only produce the data, we engage with negotiators to make sure that there's an evidence base on the table when they're at the climate COP and the biodiversity COP so that they have some resources to back up the positions that they're trying to argue for. And we work with NGOs uh, and landowners and communities uh, to discover and find ways to manage their ecosystems that are sustainable, but also to find ways to fund them to do that. And I think we're going to have some good discussions around how, once you know what you want to do with your land, how do you make it, how do you fund it how do you make it like a viable, um, a viable op uh, option? 
so that's... So, Sally, thank you very much indeed. I might say, getting hold of these three has... Uh, I need a university degree, actually. I got 15 minutes with you, um, and then we managed to have a little bit of a, you know, an email or two uh, before you went to Angola or goodness knows where you were going. But anyway, uh, it's exciting. Fezzi was also quite difficult. And, uh, but we managed to get hold of you in the end. And we had an interesting discussion, should she wear on the stage a skirt or trousers? And I said, unhesitatingly, trousers, which you've done. <laughs> but Fezzi, tell us a little bit about what you do. You're a PhD student, and, uh, and no, you're, no, you're not. I'm a postdoctoral researcher. There you go. Post PhD. So, so tell us a little bit more about what you're doing, because I had a long discussion with uh, BirdLife Africa, and they said, have you been to the Kruger Park recently? I said, no, not recently. They said, it's going to be a wilderness because the elephants are knocking absolutely everything down. And in big letters, when I was talking to you, you said, I love what the elephants are doing to the trees, full stop. <laughs> so tell us what you do. I'm sure, I'll have to clarify there. Anyways, my name is uh, Fezile Mtsefa. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Animal, Plants, and Environmental Sciences here at VETS. My work, as you might have guessed, is also centered around the, the Future Ecosystems for Africa program, where I am dedicated to help build a scientific evidence base to help manage African savannas that are resilient to impending global changes. At the moment, um, specifically, I'm working on mapping spatial and temporal distributions of um, tree biomass removal agents. So that would include elephants, uh, fire, drought, frost, and human activities. Um, and the, the goal there is to try and understand regenerative capacities of large trees and savannas once they've been impacted by these um, uh, tree removal agent, agents. And the, the, the final goal is to try and link that, to, link that to sustainable harvesting practices. So coming back to your comment, <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the way I relate with the, the ecological functions of elephants is, um, yes, in, in, in clearing trees. If you think about savannas, they have been engineered by mega herbivores. And um, what is happening in Kruger, without getting too much into elephant management, which I'm not an expert in, is maybe what we have is a problem of management. Uh, we have 85% um, 85 of, 85 of elephants right now are found only in protected areas in Africa. So we have moved large populations of mega herbivores that have been roaming freely on the continent into smaller areas. So I think what's happening, um, if it's negative in Kruger or other areas, is management of numbers. But what I like, or a problem that has been created by moving elephants into protected areas is within the areas that no longer have elephants. And that is where most of my interests lie. So look, we're going to come back to that a little bit yeah, later on. We can, we can discuss you. that a little bit more and I can clarify <laughs> what but, I mean. But thanks very much indeed for that. Now, uh, as throwaway lines go, you've got a very, very good one because I managed to track down Dr. Odorilwe Selimani in, um, not in Ceylon, but in Nepal. And he was sitting there looking at the Himalayas and I, he said, I can't talk, I'm too busy. And, <laughs> and came back, but we've had a good conversation. So your work is to do actually with funding, um, with, uh, with everything to do with money and agriculture and the, and the environment. Clarify that for us, won't you? Uh, yeah, my name is Udir Raslamani. Hello, everybody. I'm a senior, senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria, the Department of Agricultural Economics, Extension and Rural Development. And my dean is over there, Farhan uh, Um so, so what I do within FIFA in the context of what Sally was explaining uh, with regards to decision-making, influencing decision-making, it's good. It's got two parts. One, we're tracking uh, biodiversity flows data, um, so biodiversity financing flows data from, from different countries with uh, an objective of identifying what 
countries pledge in this global agreement, such as the GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, does it get followed up with financing? So that's one thing. The other thing is, does the funding that is allocated for sort of nature positive investment, how does it stack up against funding that flows for nature negative or nature eroding investments? And so far, the story is that of course, um, at least globally, it's, it's 140 times more nature eroding investment to uh, nature, nature building investment, so to speak. So the balance is really terrible. So when we talk about financing, we're not only talking about increasing financing into, into biodiversity, we're also talking about reducing nature eroding investments. Um, yeah. All right, thank you very much indeed. So we're going, I mean, we're obviously going to come back to that. So, um, uh, but it was a good throwaway line. You know, I'm looking at the Himalayas. I thought that was actually quite cool. So, Jane, over 60 years ago, as we all know, you were um, working at Gombe. You revolutionized um, the relationships that we thought we had with animals. Um, you proved beyond doubt um, that chimpanzees could um, use bits of wood and twigs and bark and get ants and do all sorts. In other words, they use tools and things like that. But over those 60 years, you've been coming and going to Gombe. And I wonder what you see now, what you saw then. How has, how has that journey to Gombe actually changed physically? Well, first of all, <laughs> Gombe itself has changed beyond recognition. When I began in 1960, was part of a great equatorial forest belt. Uh, by the late 1980s, it was just a small island of forest surrounded by bare hills. The chimpanzees were isolated. Uh, we've done something about it, but I'll talk about that later. Um, when I began, it was just me. I wasn't allowed to go alone. The authorities were British back then. You know, it was a British protectorate. And uh, they said, a young girl on her own in the forest? That's ridiculous. We've never heard of such a thing. In the end, because Louis Leakey, my mentor, never gave up, they said, all right, but she can't come by herself. She has to come with a companion. Well, that was my mother, my amazing mother. I might talk a bit more about her later because she's been so important in my life. But one of the big differences is tourism. Gombe is filled with tourists. The regulations are one group at a time, six people with a guide. But because Gombe is so small, because there aren't that many chimpanzees, it can be one group goes up into the mountains. After a certain time, another group goes. Then maybe a third group. And maybe there's only one chimpanzee anywhere near. So you may have one mother and baby with all these three groups of six tourists and a guide. And it's, it's just so different. It's, um, you know, it's still a beautiful place. The vegetation is wonderful. Tourists love going there. They have, a, they have an amazing experience. But for me, it's very different. Is it sustainable? The same. Do you think it's sustainable? I mean, you've got the tourists, but not too many chimpanzees. No, we've got just over 100 chimpanzees. We did have three communities. One community's gone. And, um, you know, so there just aren't that many chimpanzees. And all the tourists come to the central group, the Kasekela group. And so, yeah, sometimes it's better. There's lots of chimps around. All right. So I want to talk to you about a remarkable woman. Cool, and if I know that you know her, and I was talking to her just the other day, um, and it's Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikuzoza. And um, you wrote the preface to this book. Whenever I see a wildlife book, by the way, it is almost always prefaced by you. So I don't know what you did during COVID, but clearly a lot of reading, um, because it, it's all over the place. This is an extraordinary story, and I think it's germane to what we're trying to do this evening and what is happening, hopefully, in the rest of Africa. So it's no longer 
people can no longer impose what they want on other people. It's got to be something that is shared altogether. And when you wrote the foreword to this, you talked about Gladys, and Gladys, let me just tell you, is um, she's about 45, she's very vibrant, she's got a very supportive husband, which I think is important. She's the first female wildlife vet in Uganda, and she's always had a thing about uh, mountain gorillas. And so what she did is when she got her degrees, she started working with mountain gorillas and discovered the illnesses that they suffered from, even flu. During COVID, they had to be totally isolated. Um, they can pick up just about anything from human beings. And it didn't take her very long to realize that they were sometimes catching flu, pneumonia, all sorts of things from the villages um, that came to visit them or that just lived down, basically down the road. And so she started. And I'd like you to pick up the story there because it's also what you are doing. You're working with local communities. You're bringing health to the local communities. You're bringing education to the local communities. And what she has done is she has done everything that she didn't know that she was going to do, and it's working. And I think it's one of the stories for Africa. What do you think? Yes, I mean, you know, we, we, she came and visited at Gombe. She was doing her veterinary studies. She was, as you say, fascinated by chimpanzees. She pushed through, she got her degree, and there she is, a female African veterinarian working with gorillas and sometimes other animals too. So it's just one example of what's happening, how the world is changing, how women are taking on an ever more important role. Tell us a little bit, but I, I was interested in the fact that um, the villagers came to her and said, could you help us with contraception? And she got a whole system going with the help of the government eventually, because she's a, she's a powerful woman, I think. And, um, and they trained people to give contraceptive injections. It was too far to get to the clinic, so she arranged for the clinic to come to the villages. And these are in disparate places all over. And they got so many lessons. Schools were built um, because they, the kids couldn't cross the rivers to get to the schools, but the schools came to them. And it just seemed to me that this is something very healthy. And the final thing was the poaching started as soon, again, as soon as COVID hit and the tourists went away. So what she did is she got the local people to plant coffee beans. And she's now got a thriving industry. They've got, it's their industry. They've got a thriving industry in coffee beans. Some of the beans were imported to South Africa, but not at the moment. And, uh, and I just thought the lessons there for us all over the continent, whether it's Sally, you, because you do formidable work right out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. What are the lessons from, from what you're hearing today? Uh, yeah, it's a really inspiring story. Um, and I think, I think what you're saying is that often when, you, when you're trying to conserve special animals or special ecosystems, you end up starting with the people and finding out what they want and what they need. Um, and then you can maybe find potential solutions that you didn't know existed before. Um, so that's quite inspiring. Um, we have some examples uh, similarly where you have these parks. I've just been in Angola in a park called Bikwa National Park, which is just a little bit um, to the east of Lubango, a beautiful part of the world. Um, Lubango is on the escarpment, so we have the Drakensberg escarpment, and that is the escarpment on the other side of Africa. But as you go down, there's an immense amount of cattle grazing and high numbers of people on the outside of this park. Um, and then you have this massive 800 kilometer squared park, not tiny, tiny like Gombe, but still being eaten away on the edges often by people with their needs. Um, but what we realized being there is that one of the big challenges when you talk to the managers, they're like, our real challenge is fire. We have two intense fires. The fires are burning the trees and the the fires are burning the trees faster than they can regenerate. 
Um, and so then there's all this enthusiasm to try to manage the fires and reduce the fires and come with your helicopters and stop the fires. There's a 35 million euro project coming in to try to do this. But we know that actually it's quite hard to manage fire in Africa. Like, just because you want to reduce the fire doesn't mean it's always that easy because it's often a response to ecosystem processes. Um, but we also know from work in Kruger and Serengeti and places with more animals that sometimes when you have animals in the park and when you have higher animal numbers, then they eat the grass, they eat the fuel, and your fires get less intense um, just through that interaction with animals. Um, and so then we notice that on the edge of the park where the people are bringing their cattle in to eat, the fire regimes are actually less intense and the trees are healthier. So this, this could be seen as an opportunity to really work with the communities, to see with maybe the animals that they have, which admittedly are cattle, it's not the buffalo and the beautiful sable that used to be there before, but the animals that they have could help us to manage our fire regime in a way that's a lot less expensive than big helicopters and might actually work better. Um, so finding those sweet spots where actually you can do something useful that everyone agrees would be beneficial is what we're trying to do. So, Fezi, does your work include fire? Um, because I, I want to know how long it takes an elephant-felled marula tree to regenerate and to grow. I mean, how long does it take? I mean, and fire. Fire's obviously got to affect the trees as well. Sorry, how long does it take what? So an elephant pushes a marula tree down mm -hmm. because it, it likes getting drunk, basically. And, um, and it does what elephants do. And then it wanders off and takes down another tree. So, so what does your work show about how quickly the marula trees can regenerate? I mean, do they drop seeds? And how long does it take before they grow again? Um, I think what I can say to that is... Um, when you have top kill agents or the things that remove uh, tree biomass, like you have elephants and you have fire occurring together, they definitely exacerbate the effects of the other. So we do not really know how long it will take a tree to regenerate after it's been knocked down by a tree and then burnt by fire, you know, like specifically like that. But um, we just do know that when these agents occur together, they exacerbate the effects of the other. I'm not sure. Sally looks like she's eager to add on to, <laughs> to, to what I'm saying. No, I fully agree with you. Um, but I just was really highlighting, you know, you have been to the Kruger Park, I assume, and you love these ecosystems. Um, and yet, you think of an elephant knocking a tree down and then it needs to take a seed and the seed needs to germinate and grow into a new tree. But actually, marula trees are incredibly good at re-sprouting. So if you knock it down, it just regrows again using its existing root system. Um, and this is actually a major part of Fisile's work, is understanding how strong is that re-sprouting response. So how, like, marula trees are fairly resilient to elephant toppling because they have this sort of way to bypass the dangers of being a little seedling and making use of the existing root system to grow another tall trunk again. Um, so, I think we really need to work hard on telling people about how amazing our trees are and sometimes use that knowledge to help us create maybe harvesting regimes that can benefit from the fact that our trees are really good at regrowing after you've cut them down. So, I just wanted to follow on from what you were saying. So, let's talk about you and money because everything comes down to funding, doesn't it? There's your microphone. Sometimes. Okay, so, so talk to us about, um, I mean, I'm really, really interesting. Your research assesses how much money is coming in from different companies um, for conservation. But the same companies, as I understand it, are also funding mining. So one is useful for nature, it's exactly what we want, and the other one is hostile. Tell us about this funding well, the story is a bit broader than funding itself. It's a story of, I, th I think it's captured a bit in the, in the example you gave where somebody's, somebody's trying to protect uh, gorillas and they, some people are asking them about contraceptives. And I think for, for me, that story exemplifies the, the issue that conservation and development are not separate. Th they don't have to be separate things. You don't have to develop there and, and do conservation there. 
uh, these two things can be done together. But when we look at, when we, when we separate them into, here's conservation funding there, and here's a nature eroding investment there, we see that at the moment, the overwhelming priority is on the nature eroding investments. There is a real opportunity to link this two back together in a way that we can do agriculture better, we can do uh, we can ro road infrastructure better, we can do all the investments. So the, 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 the question is not don't develop or don't build infrastructures. How do you build infrastructure in a way that is less destructive? Um, so so I, I think often the, this, what I would like to think of the false, false dichotomy between priorities for conservation versus priorities for development. In, in a continent like Africa, that, that is coming. The, if you look at the, the planned and ongoing mega projects that are going on in the continent, huge projects that are cutting across big ports and, and um, that are being developed now are not going to be stopped necessarily. So how does conservation survive in that space and how does development survive in the space of conservation? We're talking about uh, 30 by increasing conservation by 30 by 30. That requires money. That money is also money that is uh, uh, competing you're competing for investment in, in, in those sectors with, with uh, conservation and funding as well. So I think the conversation needs to be, to me at least, needs to, needs to stop pitting these two things together and start finding ways to do both at the same time. And how difficult is that? How difficult is that? Yes. It's extremely difficult. Uh, in part because, um, and I think it's changing, uh, but in part because the, the, the two communities at the moment operate in very different spaces. So if you, if you, if you talk to uh, people who do development almost exclusively, they don't very often think about conservation. If you think about people who do conservation exclusively, they rarely think about development as well. And so the, the starting point is that they, they're looking at each other like this, as one is wrong, you're stopping me from developing, you're stopping me from, from conserving. So I think that conversation has to shift, and it is shifting. Um, if, if you, the, the kind of conferences that I go to myself, so I, I come from agricultural economics originally, but I go to the sustainability conferences where people don't really identify with the discipline to start. They look at the problems. Here's a problem in front of us. What are some of the innovative things we should be doing, regardless of whether it's something that's coming from conservation, from development, from economics? It's, the problem is in front of us. What do we need to do to solve it? And I think those conversations are what we need to be having uh, that are really trying to bridge the gap rather than pitting things against each other. And Jane, yes, yeah. I was going to ask Jane a question, if you don't mind, about this, because I would love to know your experience of where and how you sought funding to do the things that you wanted to do. Um, and what types of funders you think... Uh, did they come with strings attached to the funding? Were you able to guide the funding in the way that you thought it would? I would you've got years of experience in terms of juggling the sorts of issues that Odie is talking about, and it would be great to hear your thoughts, if you don't mind. Well, first of all, funding has always been a big, big problem, right from the very beginning. Yeah. So initially, it came from National Geographic. And that lasted quite a long time from the, from the Geographic Society. And then we managed to get some money from um, DFID, the British government. Today, a huge amount of our research in Africa is funded by USAID. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we're very often in a position of having to turn down funding because it comes from a company that is mining, as you say, something like that. And people in my position, you know, People are very quick to criticize and say, well, you know, you're trying to fight uh, the creation of um, greenhouse gases, and yet you're taking money to make those people look good, and they're creating the greenhouse gases. You know all about that. And um, we had to turn down uh, a good deal of money from other sources as well. As well. One was, do you know Glock, the firearms? They wanted to give us... Uh, something like $500,000, we had to say no. And so that, that's an ethical issue which I think is very, very important. And one came up just two days ago, it's really interesting you say this, 
This was somebody who said, I know someone who knows, owns six big private jets and um, I'm going to get them to put so much money for your research per seat and that will bring in an, <clears throat> an awful lot of money mm. and people are going to use private jets anyway. So we're still thinking about it but my answer is going to be no mm. because it's carbon credits. And I don't know what you think about carbon credits. And there's, you know, I know many, many good people who take carbon credits. But if you take, if you do carbon credits, that means it's fine to go on polluting forever as long as you plant trees and protect forests. So it, it's a real complicated ethical issue. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought it up because it's tough. <laughs> so, so, I mean, when you have a shortfall, because if you look at what you're doing around the world, I mean, you have got an empire um, for almost well, in 60 different countries. I mean, I think it is quite extraordinary. So that requires a significant amount of money. What do you do when there's a shortfall? I mean, how does it impact you and the people who work for you? Well, we have a, a global organization that coordinates everything. And so if a shortfall comes in a certain country, we, we get our global community to see if we can fill in that, that, that shortfall. And also, you know, each JGI is an independent organization within its country, but signing on to a charter as to methods of, you know, how we will get money, for example. And so we've always managed to fill in the shortfall without resorting to taking money from a company that honestly wants to go, it wants to look green. Definitely, they want to look green. And they would love to be able to give money to Jane. Yeah. yeah. So they're sulking, I presume. So, Odie, do you have some thoughts about this? Because this is your field. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a very tricky subject, obviously, uh, because of uh, moral issues, ethical issues. There is, however, some, at least some interesting development that I've seen uh, where um, s some researchers are borrowing this, this idea of keystone species. I'm not an ecologist myself, but lots of ecologists in the room, so you know what I'm talking about. What they're doing, or at least they're experimenting with this idea that um, it, it started with, with the marine environment, so in the oceans, where they've identified that um, I think it was about 20 companies globally control something like 65% of the fishing effort. So their project or their program is trying to engage with these companies as the biggest uh, influencers of, of the fishing effort in the ocean as a way to say, if we get the buy-in of this few people, we could potentially have a really big cascading impact in the oceans. Um, so far, it's early days to see if that works or not. And of course, they're also walking very thin line of um, um, when they publish their results. So these are researchers at universities. Um, I'm not going to mention names, but when, when, they, when they first published their research, they got massive lawsuits coming for them that they suddenly have to, to be defending themselves against the, the research outputs. Because as part of that, they're exposing all sorts of things that are suddenly putting them in all sorts of danger. But, but, but behind that, the, the real effort that they're trying to get at is, if you identify these keystone companies, could you, uh, what could you do if you get the buy-in of the 65% of global fishing effort? Um, and I think there is, in some way, there is some, some real opportunity there, as well as, of course, risks that, are, that have been mentioned already here. So. So, so let's have a look. Fezzi, how do you quantify and map human wood and timber? I mean, this is a, a question that, that, in fact, Sally was discussing with me um, in timber harvesting in relation to elephant damage. Just tell us how it works. So um, my goal is not exactly to quantify uh, wood harvesting. What I am, um, or what... Uh, the work that FIFA is doing, is interested in doing, is finding out or rather setting a, a baseline for sustainable harvesting. 
we are trying to get a, an ecological definition for sustainable harvesting. And getting back to the comment you made with the elephants, um, having moved elephants or larger populations of elephants into protected areas, we are left without elephants outside of protected areas. So what I'm saying maybe with that, and we have had people move in, obviously. So with that, that might not be an entirely bad thing uh, to have people harvesting trees. We just need to know how much with those environmental agents that I listed earlier on, uh, the, the, the elephants, uh, fire, um, naturally how much harvesting would those have done? And if we can get that baseline, we can maybe be able to inform the sustainable harvesting practices that Sally was talking about by advising communities to say, this is how much you could possibly cut down, but maybe considering you also keep cattle and do this and this, this is a level that we can discuss as sustainable ecologically. So are you thinking about um, business people coming into, say, the Kruger Park, just for, uh, I mean, to, to plant timber plantations, hundreds of marula trees, for instance, um, how, how is that going to work? Because you need funding. I mean, everybody needs funding, it just seems to me, and there isn't a lot of money left in the world. With the wars that we've got, I think the world is in a parlous position at the moment, and I think funding becomes more and more important. So actually when I'm talking about tree harvesting, I'm talking about local communities just harvesting uh, subsistently to go and create fire to cook. Like I'm not talking about commercial tree harvesting, that is very destructive. So that would be, that would be a whole other conversation. <laughs> No. So we're talking about if, because we, as conservationists, we tend to tell communities to leave things alone, do not touch that. And that's our approach. We mostly protect. At the moment, we are looking at, at managing approaches. So how can we advise communities to manage their um, ecosystem sustainably? So Jane, it seems to me that sometimes we're looking at things in such a different way. So the Kruger Park used to be just animals. I don't have any great objections to people living on the borders of the Kruger Park coming in and possibly putting cattle in it if it can actually be shown to work properly. But is there going to come a time where humans themselves are going to have to back away in order to settle this whole ecology that, that we're talking about? Because we're not looking at things the way we looked at them even 20 years ago, are we? No, we're not. And even 20 years ago, the world was in a better state than it is now. And, you know, when it comes to people and nature living in harmony together, that's basically what I'm about to be talking about. So I'd, I'd rather not talk about it too much now. But there are ways in which people can live in harmony with nature, and there's other ways, and I think your mention of cattle is one way that doesn't work. I don't think, in, in Africa anyway, that you can have a, a natural area with a, quite a lot of cattle, because it, it, it doesn't work. I've seen it happen so often on the Serengeti and, and other parts of, of Kenya, where people come in with cattle. It's happening around Gombe, with the Samburua coming down from the north with their cattle and the forest where, the, where there were chimpanzees, people living there, now the forests are disappearing. Cattle are a big problem. Uh, I just, just to follow up on what um, Jane just um, put forward, but then it, it's a question also, because then I'm wondering then what happens in these ecosystems where we no longer have mega herbivores, wouldn't you think that to some degree, maybe at certain numbers, cattle are actually good for at least a savanna ecosystem to keep it somewhat open. Otherwise, we have bush encroachment to some degree. Well, I, mean, I mean, you know, this really isn't my field. And it's, it's something that, that impinges on what we do. And we have certain people who are involved in that. But it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be different in different places. It's going to be different as the kind of cattle that you're ranching. It's going to be different in, in, in all sorts of different uh, situations. It's, I don't think there's one answer. 
And it also depends if you're going to sort of try and multiply your cattle or whether you're content to have just a few to provide milk for your tribe or something like that. So, Sally, I know you're going to open your mouth. I was um, <laughs> I, want you, I want you to talk a, a little bit about the work that you're doing in the Nyasa Conservation Park. Just tell us a little bit what is going on there, because there are significant numbers of people living there, aren't there? Yes, there are indeed. I just, I suppose, wanted to affirm what you said about the, the context really matters. Like, <laughs> there are some ecosystems and some societies in Africa where grazing is, um, and livestock are really similar to the type of grazers who used to be there. And there are some ecosystems where livestock has never been. Um, and we're lucky in Africa that many of our ecosystems that are sensitive to livestock grazing we don't have cultures of people that have cows. So still across large parts of the Miombo, we don't have a lot of pastoralism because that's never been a, a useful thing to do in those systems. Whereas in South America, they've plumped a whole lot of resources in, they've cut down the trees, they've poured fertilizer on to create cattle systems in yeah. systems that are not appropriate for it. But that doesn't mean to say, like you say, that there aren't these beautiful, open pastoral landscapes where cattle have always been interacting with wildlife in a healthy way. So Nyasa is a park that doesn't have any cattle at all because it's in these Miyomo ecosystems. They're really nutrient poor. There's just not enough food for the cows to eat. So that's not an issue in Nyasa. Um, and I think this comes back to the theme of this discussion, which is around protect, manage, and restore, um, and discussing what protection looks like in Africa. I think many of the things we've been talking about are around what does protection look like, and perhaps to cover our bases, we should be trying a lot of different forms of protection, because the Nyasa Special Conservation Area, they designed it back in the 1960s, and they just said, now we're going to conserve this area, and they never asked the people to leave. So. There's these beautiful open landscapes where various forms of resource extraction are not allowed, but where communities live and practice their lives and bring up their children and grow and eat and go to school inside the conservation areas. Um, it makes for all sorts of challenges because the way that money, the way that these concessions get money is through tourism, high-end tourism and hunting. And many of those people don't want to see people in their parks. They want to come to Africa and have a wilderness experience. They've paid a lot of money to come and shoot a lion, and they don't want to see people cutting down trees, harvesting honey, you know, washing themselves in the rivers. So it's a really fascinating challenge. Um, but what we're doing is trying to identify, like, under what conditions are people there uh, disrupting the processes that should be there and to work with the managers to identify like what sorts of rules should be put in place like if people did want to suddenly come with a tractor and plow and put fertilizer to make more money and even grow coffee that might not be something that should be allowed but we don't you know so we're negotiating and discussing what type of human use could work in a conservation area that is actually three times the size of the Kruger National Park I think um, it's massive. So, I mean, we, we, we could go on for a long time, but we can't. Mm. But, Odie, I just want to ask you with the, the, the whole funding thing, are we using land correctly? I mean, are we, is that part of what you do? Because it seems to me cattle are yeah. being put into places where cattle shouldn't be. Uh, that's one thing, that we're not using the land correctly. Maybe we should be planting something. And Jane, you might have thoughts about that as well. Because are we using the land? We've got huge amounts of land, but are we, are we maximizing it in the way that it's meant to be? You're asking me or... I'm, uh, well, both of you. Um, yeah, so I, I can't answer the question about whether we're using land correctly or not, because I think that... Um, Land is owned by people, by, so decisions about how it's used, it's, uh, it's, it's different. What, what, something that we're doing that is, um, so this is under the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPES. It's basically IPCC for biodiversity, in, in short. So uh, 
for the, for the past two and a half years I've been involved in this uh, assessment. It's a global assessment on uh, the nexus of food, biodiversity, climate, health, and water. And what we're looking there is, do the policies that are put forward in, in any number of these sectors, so what, what is the impact of biodiversity policies on, on health, on food, on climate? And similarly, what are the impacts of, of policies for climate? So if you talk about net zero, which people are talking about all over the place, what does that mean for other uses of, of land, achieving the policies that are set out for, 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 for development, for conservation? So this nexus assessment, in some ways, gets at that question of, are we using things correctly without talking about land specifically? But if, if, if all the policies that are put forward and the, 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 the investments and whatever follows, the implementation that follows there, results in a net negative for everyone involved, you can safely say we're not using it correctly. If it comes out with a net synergistic outcome for, for these things, you could say this is a proxy for using land correctly. So, so at, at the moment, I would say uh, not. Uh, at least what we're seeing from this, from this uh, analysis is that most of the outcomes are uh, favoring one, one policy. So they're either favoring a, a climate outcome or a biodiversity outcome or a food outcome. At the moment, mostly food, uh, agriculture, um, growing substantially at the expense of, of the other sectors. Um, so in, in short, I'd say we're not, but uh, not speaking directly about land. So... As we come to an end with this discussion, I'm wondering, what are we lacking? Um, and all of you, I'd love to hear from all of you, what are we missing? Um, what can African scientists and conservationists do to ensure global conservation? I mean, I think that's really important. Climate mitigation efforts. I mean, we've got a heat wave out there that is just almost intolerable, and people working and living and out of doors, I think is, is hard. Things are, are changing. And, and driving nature and people positive policies in Africa. I mean, surely this is something that, that is inimical to all of us. Sally, do you want to have a go with that first? Yeah, I think in order to answer that, it would be nice to circle back to the discussion around funders. Um, because finally, the world has really woken up to the climate and biodiversity crisis, which means that finally significant amounts of money has been put on the table and more is going to come. So I think in future we might actually find ourselves in the position you have found yourself in, where actually there is a lot of funding available because the world has signed up to trying to fix these problems that you're highlighting, and they think that Africa might be a place to help do that. So we need to make sure that we can guide that funding into places that achieve our goals and places that we, as scientists, people living in Africa, we know to the best of our knowledge to be appropriate ways to do that. Um, and I can carry on for hours to tell you, like, because otherwise really some damaging things can happen because there are so many examples, like you said, where an, in the context, something that someone thought was good somewhere gets applied here in Africa with really negative consequences. But we can help to guide that funding. And so that's really what we should be doing. We should be making sure that we highlight things that we can do that even if it's at a very small scale, like working with landowners, mm -hmm. like this patch of land, if you use it differently, if you don't plow, if you get your money elsewhere, different sorts of funding, we find those, and then we make sure that the money gets channeled in those directions. And that involves engaging with the funders and making them part of the process and trying to make them have different priorities for when they give us our funding. One of the challenges of the African group of negotiators is that there's money on the table. You know, countries will allocate piles of money to Ghana for their um, carbon mitigation activities. But the negotiators know that that money is not going to be used properly, but they don't want to say no to the money. So we really need to come up with our own ideas. When someone says, here's some money, you could say, like, this is the right thing to do. We have evidence to show that if you pour your money this way, you're going to get some good benefits. That's what we need to do. Fezzi, do you want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. It's been a bit difficult to segue back to points that uh, one wanted to make in relation to what other people had been, had been saying. Um, I think that what we are lacking or needing, and I'm going to take this from um, a paper published recently by 200 African experts led by Clements, um, a lack of context, contextualized um, data from the continent. Um, if we lack that, then international decision making is somehow always biased towards the global north. So we need to be working towards creating um, data for the continent using uh, researchers on the continent working on a, glo uh, on a continental scale, uh, collaborating a little bit more. For example, like this um, research that I've just cited, they did an amazing job of, I think it's called the Biodiversity in Intactness Index, uh, looking at multiple faunal and floral species across the region, and they've been able to put forward data that can be used for various uh, policy decision making mm -hmm. and used by other researchers just by coming together as um, researchers on the continent, and I think that's an initiative that was funded by OGRC, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's been really helpful, and we need more initiatives like that, and looking at work that does that, and coming together to do research like that. Do you want to add anything to that, Herdy? Yeah, maybe quickly to say that I think, for me, what's important is that um, to, to also look a bit into the continent and what, what's going on. I think people are doing some really interesting things at very small scale that's invisible and it often gets overshadowed by this global narratives about what needs to be done for this big uh, global story but but I think to to what Sally and, and Fezi have said is that some of the some of the things that people are doing on the ground can be scaled up to 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 provide really alternative solutions to the solutions that are on the table at the moment that have in a lot of ways haven't worked um, and so wh where should we look for something different and I think we should start looking at what, what people are doing that's interesting and innovative and, and, and thinking about ways of scaling this up in a way that can provide some real, real alternatives. So Jane, because I know that you're going to be speaking to us in a couple of minutes' time, do you think that data and science, more data and science, is necessary? Or do we really know what to do and how to do it? We just don't implement it. What are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, you would? Data, so, data and science. And then we, do we need more data? I mean, have we not learned oh, enough? Okay. okay, I got yeah. you. Mm. Well, you know, listening to all of this, it's, it's hard for me. You know, now I'm, I'm not sitting in Africa studying like these people are. I'm traveling the world. And so you can't help having a world view. And when you have a worldview, I mean, I'm fixated on the two terrible wars in Palestine and Ukraine, thinking, and, and then there's the 15 or so conflicts across Africa. Uh, there are political nightmares, 40, 40 countries having elections this year. Some of them, uh, they're not democratic. Some of them, well, they're sort of democratic, and some of those elections maybe are the most important we'll ever have one in particular, which is coming up in November. And if we could take the money from the wars and the armaments industry and use it, we could solve the problems of poverty, we could solve so many problems, which would, which would help us to understand better how we could, how we could um, protect the environment and move ahead in a new way in Africa and other countries too. And, you know, when, when I'm thinking about Africa, okay, I know Gombe and other parts of West Africa spent quite a lot of time, Serengeti and Gorongoro. And I just can't help but be horrified at the thought of what is climate change going to do? And, you know, there are scientists who say, it's too late, it's no good, uh, the climate is going to get so hot, there's nothing we can do to slow it down. And uh, fortunately, there are others like me who believe we have a window of time. But we've got to take action. And so the most important thing now 
is what I want to talk about, is to give young people hope so that you have hope for the future. We find ways that we can affect climate change. We can slow it down and slow down loss of biodiversity. And if we can't give people hope, and so many people are losing hope, many countries have the highest rate of suicide for a long time. And so, you know, I'm seeing this in, in the whole big picture. We've got huge problems to solve. The good news is that there are groups of people working to solve all of them, whether it's war or elephants knocking down trees or, or where we take our money from. There's people working on all of that. Um, so often they're working in silos and they don't communicate with each other. And what we need is more collaboration, more cooperation, more sharing results from different kinds of studies but also seeing it in this whole big picture of what we must do to save the planet. If we can't save the planet, we can't save Africa. And, okay, I don't mean to bring in a note of gloom. My whole talk is going to be about hope, but I cannot help seeing it in this whole big picture, which makes it hard for me to answer the question that you asked. Jane Goodall, thank you very much indeed. And I just want to say thank you very much to Oppenheimer Generations Research Conservation. Thank you very much for putting together this evening. It's been very special. And, um, and at the end of this year, we've got uh, Prince William and Earthshot uh, coming to Cape Town. I'm so excited. I'm almost sick with excitement because it's going to draw attention to Africa, not necessarily to Cape Town, but to some of the wonderful things that we are doing on this continent and that we should be doing on this continent. So I see just uh, some amazing things happening. So thank you, everybody. And now put your hands together, please. Jane is going to give us an address. Okay, we're just going to move down. So I don't need this. Yeah, you don't need this. <clears throat> it's a bit awkward up here, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, first of all, I think I've already said good evening to you all when I was sitting there, but I'll say it again. And I want to start off by thanking the people on the panel with me and I'm hoping to be able to talk to them later about all the wonderful things that they're doing. I have to start off with a story that you began about the dog when I came to your house, because there's something in it that you missed out, which was the key. That is, uh, when, I, when I first got to Cambridge University to do a PhD 
although I'd never done an undergraduate degree. But Leakey said, after I'd been with the chimpanzees two years, he told me that I would have to get a degree because he wanted scientists to listen to me, and they weren't. I mean, I had never been to college, so why should they listen to this young girl? Why should they believe chimpanzees use tools for termites and so on? So there I was, arriving in Cambridge, uh, never having been to college, being told I had to do a PhD and in ethology, I didn't know what ethology was. I had to find out behavior. And can you imagine how I felt when all these scientists told me that I'd done everything wrong? Jane, you shouldn't have given the chimps names. You shouldn't have uh, talked about them having personalities, minds capable of problem solving, and certainly not emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, despair. Those are unique to us. They actually believed, this is 1961 or two, they believed at that time, science believed, that we were separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. And there was I, nervous, being told I'd done everything wrong. But fortunately, I had a wonderful teacher when I was a child. And that teacher taught me that in this respect, these professors were completely, totally, utterly wrong. That teacher is one that many of you probably know, was my dog. And if you share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, cat, horse, pig, bird, I don't care, you know perfectly well, we are not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. So I tell that story almost every lecture because I think it's really important. And it was when I was thinking about talking about my dog that your dog appeared from somewhere in the back of the room, went his way through the people, climbed up. He didn't curl up beside me. He stood with his side touching my leg, looking out over the people. And then he lay down, sphinx-like, I've got a photo which we weren't supposed to take. I'll share it with you. And looking out over the people. As soon as I stopped talking about my dog, Rusty, he left. This was the amazing thing. It wasn't only that he came, but he came just for that moment. And so this reinforces my belief that we have other ways of communication than just speaking like that. So anyway, um, I've got 20 minutes, and we've been discussing a whole variety of different things. But what I want to, to bring out is how I came to do what I do, and how things have changed since I began to study the chimpanzees. First of all, I was born loving animals, and I had an amazing supportive mother. And I really want to emphasize the importance of of having supportive parents. Because uh, when, when I was told at school that there was no way I could go to Africa and live with wild animals and write books about them, I had no idea of being a scientist. Girls weren't scientists back then. But writing books, yes. And uh, I was told that there was no way that this could happen. Didn't have money, was just a girl and Africa was far away, and we called it the Dark Continent back then. We're now back in 1944. And, but my mother said, no, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity, and if you don't give up, hopefully you find a way. And I've taken that message around the world and shared it particularly with young people in poorer communities and the number of them who've said, Jane, you taught me because you did it, I can do it too. It's all about this hope thing. And so I had to get a job when I left school. We didn't have money for university. I learned shorthand and typing, which was boring, but I always do everything as best I can. I got a job in London. And then I got an invitation to stay with a school friend who'd moved to Kenya. So, yes, yes, that's the opportunity. I'll get to Africa. Couldn't save money in London, went home, worked as a waitress, and finally saved up enough to get to Africa. And by the way, 
the very first place I landed on African soil was Cape Town. And I was so excited. I mean, you know, there were native people dressed up in all their finery. I didn't know it was for tourism. And it was by boat, because back then there weren't planes going back and forth, and you couldn't possibly have afforded a plane. And my mother had friends who said that they'd look after me for the two days the ship was in dock. And they took me round, and it was first so exciting. I'm in Africa. But then I began seeing these words in Afrikaans on the doors to the hotels and restaurants, and I asked, what do they mean? Whites only. But I wasn't brought up that way. My grandfather was a congregational minister, and we didn't judge people by the color of their skin, but by who they were as human beings. So I couldn't wait to leave uh, Cape Town. And when I finally got to Kenya, it was much better. It was on the very, very brink I think about four months away from independence, from British colonial rule. And so that's, that's how I first came to Africa. And then I met Louis Leakey. And it was Louis Leakey who amazingly gave me the opportunity to go and live with and study not just any animal, but the one most like us. And that was, it was like a kind of fate. I would have studied any animal, any animal, to be out in the bush. And here I am, landed with a, an animal who shares 98.7% of our DNA, our closest relative, even closer than the gorilla, and closer again from the orangutan, equal with the little bonobo that used to be called the pygmy chimp. And so, then going to Cambridge and getting my PhD and starting a research station uh, in, in Gombe National Park. And they were the best days of my life, being out in the forest, learning about the interconnection of all the species of plants and animals in the forest ecosystem. And having a very strong spiritual connection with the natural world. And I think that's something science doesn't like talking about something like that. But then I wasn't ever a proper typical scientist. I never went to university to become a scientist. Louis Leakey told me I had to get a degree. And so in that way, I became, I suppose, a scientist. I got my PhD. But so at any rate, they were the very best days of my life, a few wonderful very uh, dynamic students, learning more about the chimps, learning about the natural world and the other animals living there. So why did I leave? I left because at a big scientific conference that I helped to organize in 1986, we had for the first time the people studying chimpanzees. By then there were six other field study sites. And we brought them all together, mainly to learn more about chimps like how much do chimps differ from one environment to another? What behavior stays the same? Is there something like culture, which I had said, and I'd been scorned by science, but of course, as we now know, it's not only chimpanzees, but many other animals who have their own culture. But we had a session on conservation, and it was an absolute shock. I mean, I knew that around Gombe, chimpanzee numbers were were dropping and I knew that there was deforestation. But I wasn't prepared to hear that right across Africa, wherever chimps were studied, whole forests were disappearing along with all the biodiversity in them. Chimp numbers were hugely dropping. So I got together some money from National Geographic, managed to visit all six study sites. Uh, one actually was in Angola, just between the wars. and. I learned a lot about the chimps' problems, the bushmeat trade, the shooting of mothers to take infants to sell in the live animal trade, um, the, 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 the um, snares set by hunters. But I also learned a lot about the problems faced by so many of the human people living in and around chimpanzee habitat, the crippling poverty, the lack of good health and education facilities, the degradation of the land, they're moving deeper and deeper into the forest, running the risk 
of catching diseases from chimps and gorillas and probably far more dangerous actually giving those human diseases to chimps and gorillas, which has happened both ways, by the way. So uh, when I left that conference, I had changed. I went as a scientist, planning to spend the rest of my life probably studying chimpanzees in different areas to learn more about culture. But I left as an activist. It was partly because also there was a session on conditions in captive situations, and some of this was absolutely shocking, but there's no time to go into that now, and much of it has been addressed. But, um, so, I didn't know what to do. I, uh, I met a wonderful man, a German, French German, George Stronden, and we talked about this situation, finding that Gombe was just a little tiny island of forest and all around were these bare hills instead of a continuous forest to the west coast. And with George, we planned what we could try to do to save the situation. And I believe it was the very first community-led conservation program because right from the very beginning, we went into the villages, uh, selected a group of local Tanzanians, seven of them. They went into the villages and they asked the villagers, what can we do to make your lives better? And what they wanted to start with was to grow more food because their own land was over, overused and they wanted better education and better health, especially for their children. And so that's where we began. And we managed to get money, I mentioned earlier, was from the British government at the time. No, sorry, it was from the EU. It was a big problem getting that first money because the EU said, no, you are asking for too little. And this was the 12 villages around Gombe. And we said, but this is something new. We don't know if it's going to work. We can't ask for more money. So in the end, they solved it by giving us the amount of money we want, but spread over different years. So it, it made them feel good to give more money. Anyway, so this is how we began. And gradually, the people came to trust us. And they're not very trusting people, the, the Waha, as they are there along the shore of Lake Tanganyika. But gradually, they came to see that Unlike other conservationists who came, did their study, or scientists rather, did their study and left, we stayed. And we helped them try to get money. So then we could introduce other things into, into the program. We introduced um, scholarships to give girls a chance of, of secondary education because back then almost no girls went to secondary school. Uh, we did the help them to develop the health and education as they wanted, but on top of that got these scholarships. We introduced microfinance, which I believe is one of the keys to solving poverty, because these people were able to, to take very small sums of money from the microfinance banks that we set up with the help of Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh who began the system. And so if you take out a small amount of money, it had to be for an environmentally sustainable project like a tree nursery because we knew we needed to plant trees in some of these bare slopes. But if they take out a small amount and then it, their project works and they can pay back. They are proud, I've done it. And then they can ask for a slightly larger amount of money, which they can then get, and then they pay back. And we have seen in the 12 villages around Gombe the change in people's lives, the change in the education system, the change in the health system. And so we were able to spread this program, which is called Tokari, it began Take Care, now Tokari it's known as. It's the Jane Goodall Institute method of community-led conservation. 
It's now in 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania, almost the whole of the Chimp Range. And everywhere, people's lives are changing. So we've now introduced that program in six other African countries where JGI is studying chimpanzees. And everywhere, lives are changing. And the, peop well, the, the latest thing we introduced into this program was um, GIS, GPS satellite imagery. And this has enabled one, volunteers from the different villages to monitor the health of their forests. They're very proud of their village forest reserves. Now they were destroying them. Now they're saving them. Now they're replanting. And it also enabled the villagers to make land use management plans, which they're required to do but they couldn't afford it because these, in, being in Tanzania, they're very, every single person in the village has to have a word. So it's an expensive procedure. But anyway, that's been done. And the people have now become our, our partners in conservation. Before they resented people coming in like us, now they know that saving the environment isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. And that's why George Strunden was so brilliant when he said, no, Jane, don't let's talk about uh, conservation for chimpanzees or other animals. Just let's talk about how we can improve their lives. That was so clever of him. And so this program is now spreading. Uh, it's in these six African countries and hopefully will spread further. We've just done a book, if anyone's interested, uh, it's called Local Voices, Local Choices. And we can get some here uh, from the US. It was sponsored by ESRI, because we do a lot of work with, with ESRI and NASA and Google Earth and things like that. So that's where we are. And I've got five more minutes. Uh, so in my last five minutes, I want to talk about the importance of hope. You all know, I think, well, no, you don't all know, sorry, but some of you know about our youth program, Roots and Shoots, which began in 1991, because even back then, I was finding young people who were losing hope. And they were either angry or depressed or just didn't seem to care. And when I asked them, I was traveling all around the world by then, when I asked them everywhere, why do you feel like this? They either said, uh, well, we're depressed because it seems hopeless. We're angry because we hate people and what they're doing to the planet and to us. Or we don't care because what's the point? And so I said to them, yes, you're right. We have harmed your future, but it's not true. There's nothing that can be done about it. And so that's how Roots and Toots began. 12 high school students in Tanzania coming together we decided the main message of our program would be every single one of us, that means everybody in this room too, we all make some impact on the planet every single day. And certainly we have the choice as to what kind of impact we're going to make. And if we start thinking about what we buy, what we eat, what we wear, if we ask ourselves, did this product when it was made harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages? Then we have a choice, and consumer pressure is beginning to change the way some businesses work. And so what began with 12 high school students is now in, well, the, we just started our 70th group in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon with little children from six villages. But it's very, very strong in, in um, Europe. In, in the Americas uh, and Japan and many countries in Asia. So we've got about 1,500 groups across China, which surprises many people. And it's my greatest reason for hope because this morning I was listening to a whole lot of young people from Johannesburg coming together and telling us what they were doing in their Roots and Shoots programs to make the world better. Whether it, was, whether it was school, organic gardens, 
or whether it was helping in an animal sanctuary, whatever it was, they were taking action and they were proud it was making them feel, you know, that yes, we are doing something to save the planet. So that's my greatest reason for hope. And then there's this brain of ours. I mean, quite honestly, when you think of the ways that people have come up with developing alternative energy, when you think of the fact that people are actually able to capture carbon, CO2, from the atmosphere and store it, hopefully, safely, when you think of all the innovation that's going on now that people are feeling the pinch, and then the resilience of nature, talking about trees that elephants knock down that grow up again, that's been happening for, for centuries. Nature's resilient. It's having a tough time now because of us. It isn't natural for a whole forest to be clear cut, and it takes a lot of effort to bring the forest back, but you can, and it's been, it's been done. And there are examples from all over the world of places that we have utterly destroyed, given time and perhaps some help can once again uh, bring back nature in all her beauty. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. I did a whole book on that. And then finally, there's what I call the indomitable spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up. And you know, there are so many stories I could tell, but one that's, I, I don't know, I find it particularly, particularly moving. There's a, a man I know in Canada, and he was born with no arms, just little tiny stumps about the thickness of my wrist, um, and no legs, but coming out of his thigh is something which maybe it's a rudimentary foot, I don't know. And he'll, he goes around on a skateboard. He's been around the world by himself on a skateboard. He apparently can do almost everything. I don't know how he does some things, but he does them. And he's, he'll hop up on the sofa beside you, just as I'm about to sit on the floor with him. He hops up, and you look into a face that's so full of life and the joy of life. He drives a huge tractor that's worth something like $50,000. His friend allows him to drive it. Uh, he talks to children. Uh, he does TED Talks. You can look him up, Chris Koch, K-O-C-H. And, you know, there are, there's this indomitable spirit we find, we find in some of the poorest, poorest um, human places where, where people live. We find that indomitable spirit that won't be crushed. We find it in people who are desperately sick but they still maintain an attitude where they smile at you. And yes, we're dying, but we've had a good life. And so that's the message I have for you. And I've stopped actually one minute too late, which I hope you forgive me for. And I'd, yes, I'd like to thank the Jane Goodall Institute team that I have with me here. There's four of you, I think. Um, would you like to jump up quickly, just so people can see I'm not alone? Um. Okay, say your name. Hi everyone, thank you everyone for coming. I think I'd like to thank Oppenheimer Generations and Conservation, Duncan and team. I'm Zaman Gomani, so I'm the Roots and Shoots National Coordinator um, for South Africa. That's the she's, a, she's an interloper. She comes from, she started the Jane Goodall Institute Roots and Shoots in Turkey. Yes, I'm Asli Han. Executive Director and Chairperson of Roots and Shoots Turkey, and I'm really happy to be here and uh, be part of Roots and Shoots and Jagal Institute South Africa as well. And thank you for all of you coming here, and thank you, Jane, as always, for being a great inspiration. Well, thank you. Thank you.
Great. Uh, I'd just like to thank Dr. Goodall. I think what an inspirational address, and certainly you inspire hope, which is really important. Thank you. And I'd like to call on the Vice Chancellor and Principal of Wits University, Zeblon Velikazi, I'd just say a few words of closure. Thank you. Then between you and refreshment, so I'll be very brief. I was given a long protocol list here, which I'll not go through, but let me just uh, thank members of the VET uh, University Senior Executive Team, uh, Dr. Jane Goodall from the Jane Goodall Foundation, Nikki, Jonathan, and Kerry Oppenheimer from the Oppenheimer Generations, and the support from which the university has benefited from the Oppenheimer family for almost 100 years. Uh, the uh, program director, Duncan McFadden, um, guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the organizers of the entire team crew, the, the uh, audiovisual security, catering, and the organizing team, you are all thanked. How can I beat what Jane Goodall has said? But let me escape from reality. Take you back to 1968. Jane mentioned conflict. Uh, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam had raised. I mean, Nikki, you are a baby boomer. That is your time. Um, it was a, a few years before I was born. But then something gave us a glimmer of hope from a left field because in that period, uh, Bill Sanders, Bill Anders, and, um, and, uh, and uh, astronaut Bowman took a picture after that emerged from the dark side of the moon. Despite all that the Earth was going through at the time, they took a picture of this tiny blue dot, that mote of dust suspended in the air. The first picture since humanity originated, or all species in the world, where we could look at Earthrise. We looked at this blue planet. Bowman gave the opening chapter of the Bible, Genesis, and spoke about it. He just felt he could say that. Now, this is beautifully captured as I close from what has been said today by a beautiful, never thought astrophysicist could be poetic, beautiful prose by Carl Sagan when the first Cassini spacecraft looked at the first most distant view of planet Earth from afar. He goes as following. Our planet is a lonely dark speck, no, a lonely bright speck in the great enveloping co cos cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all its vastness, there's no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. He continues, to my mind, there's perhaps no better demonstration of this folly of human conceit than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, this tiny mote of dust, this blue marble in the middle of the darkest of the dark is our responsibility. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with each, with each other and the species we live with, and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot that is our only home, planet Earth. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Zeblon. Okay, please have yourself another drink. Canapé, was, thank you very much for being here. I think it was a very uh, wonderful evening and great to spend it with you. Thank you. Bye.
imagine Angoni rebirth. Imagine a future where nature meets technology. Imagine a kingdom rising in the north. Can you feel it rising? Are you even ready for it? Mombera Rising. A free digital anthology of Malawian short stories envisioning a Ngoni future over the next century. Written by Muti Nlema and Ekari Mfundula Chirombo. For more details, visit www.futureecosystemsafrica.org.